So today I will continue to present you about the semi martingale methods for Markov chains. Um, today we will focus on an example on the uh, photo model, which is a type of interacting particle system. So um, let me just have a quick recap of uh, what we have done in the uh, past two lectures. So um, first of all, most of the material in this um, series is from uh, this book, Non-Homogeneous Random Walk, um, by these three authors. It's a very good book, and um, it focuses on talking about the Neff plot functions method. That is uh, the focus of uh, these three lectures. Okay, so... So first of all, I want to recap this theorem. So this is a theorem uh, about the positive recurrence site, which we call the Foster criterion. So if we have a Markov chain, an irreducible Markov chain Xn, on a countably infinitely, uh, infinite state space, sigma, it, this Markov chain is positive recurrent if and only if this condition is satisfied. So the condition is if we can find a function f and a finite non-empty set A and epsilon greater than zero such that this quantity here that we have seen a few times, expectation of f n x n plus one minus f x n uh, is less than or equal to minus epsilon. And we also need another condition that the expectation of f xn plus one is finite in this uh, x in A. Okay, so today we'll try to focus on this theorem on positive recurrence and see how we can apply to uh, some models uh, that is in the interacting particle system. So let me jump to the page, okay, page. Yes. So the first model that um, I want to talk about today is called the photo model. So let us first define what the photo model is. So we consider uh, Markov processes on configurations of particles on Z. Okay. So it's just a one dimensional thing. So we take our state space as zero, one to the power z, okay? So if, if you write it all out, that you will see later, it will be a strain of one and zero on an infinite line. So we call S in this state space, zero, one to the power z, a configuration, and we interpret a coordinate, a coordinate value as x equals to one, as the precedence of a particle at the side x in z in the configuration s. And we will denote s x equals to zero as the absence of a particle, okay? So it can only be zero and one. In a mo photo model, the dynamics are driven by the presence of discrepancy zero one or one zero in the configuration. So in order to obtain a well-defined process, we consider dynamics on a configuration with only finitely many discrepancy. Okay, so, so on an infinite line, there's infinitely many one and infinitely many zero. But in our setting, we need to have this assumption that there's only finitely many zero one or one zero pair. Okay, so at each time step, the voter model, we select a random, uh, uniformly at random from all the discrepancy and then flip the chosen pair to either zero, zero or one, one with equal chance of each. So, so it looks like something like this. To, um, this is one possible 
uh, starting point. So consider the heavy side configuration defined by this one x less than or equal to zero. Okay, so all the ones are on the left and all the zero are on the right. Okay, this is one possible choice of s. Okay, and this special configuration, we call this a heavy side configuration which consists of a single pair of one zero. So this is the only pair of discrepancy in, in, in this S. Um, by an infinite string of one and zeros on the left and right, uh, respectively. So, so there's all the ones on the left, infinitely many, and there's all the zeros on the right, infinitely many. So suppose that if the photo model start from this heavy side configuration, then at any further time, it is just a random translate of the same configuration. Why? Because, well, first of all, we need to randomly choose um, this uh, discrepancy and the only choice here is this one zero, okay? And uh, we have some chance to change it to uh, one, one, or ch change it to zero, zero. So if we change it to one, one, then it will all become all, all one, and then this zero will becomes one, and then all zero here. And if we change it to zero, then this one will become zero, okay? So essentially, we will still have the same form here. It will be all the ones on the left and all the zero on the right, but we have one, one position shift. So, Indeed, the position of this rightmost particle, this one, performs a sim symmetric simple random walk. So if the photo model start from a perturbation of the heavy side configuration, it's natural to study the time it takes to reach a, reach a translation of the heavy side configuration. So this example motivate the following notation. Okay, so let this S prime, okay, the, uh, in zero one Z denotes the set of the configurations with a finite number of zeros to the left of the origin and ones to the right. And uh, S prime is in this set for which there exists L and R in Z with L less than R such that S prime X is one for all X less than or equal to L and S prime X equals to zero for all X greater than or equal to R. So what do we mean here is in other words, this big S prime contains the, those configurations of zero one Z in which only a finite number of discrepancy, okay? Because we, we, we identify the, all the ones and zero that is in the middle that, that is um, essentially not, not arranged properly. So we, we, okay. So we'll have an example about this later. So, um, so the number of discrepancy in this set of type one zero minus the number of discrepancy of type zero one is always equals to one, okay? Because they are alternating. So this S prime uh, is countable, okay? So let's this, we have this uh, similar symbol to denote the equivalence relation on S prime such that if we have two particular elements, S1 prime and S prime two, two configuration, in S prime, then we say they, they are equivalent if and only if they are just translate of each other. So you can you can move from one to, to another, okay? What it means is there exists a number Y such that S prime, uh, S one prime X is S two prime X plus Y for all X in Z, okay? So, Let's see an example here. So one possible S in, in capital S is this one, okay? So we always have uh, infinitely many number of ones on the left to start with, and then we can have a number of zero, one, zero, zero, one, and so on, okay? So we have, we have 
some discrepancy at some uh, random positions, but not all, all, all the positions in the middle. And then we end with uh, a lot of zero on the right. Okay. So we, we set this S to be S prime modulo the, the, this uh, equivalent class. So in other words, S is a set of configurations of the form infinite uh, string of ones, finite number of zeros and uh, of zero and ones, and then follow with the infinite string zero uh, model translation. Okay, so you see if we have the heavy side uh, configuration just now, which is one, 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 and then follow with a lot of zeros, then this is one equivalent class, and this is one element in S because all the translation of the heavy side uh, configuration are the same. Okay, so it's one element in the in, in this uh, S. Okay, because S is modulo translation, so we denote this heavy side configuration by S H because this is a this is a special class. So essentially, if the process go into this special class, this heavy side configuration, then it it will not. Uh, go back out because the photo the photo movement the, the change can only change any discrepancy one zero well there's only one discrepancy here is one zero to either zero zero or one one so it will always give you back the head design configuration right so that is kind of the ha Describe description of how the photo model works. So now, now we want to formulate everything properly in the model. So the model um, psi n, n greater than or equal to zero, is a time homogeneous Markov chain on the countable state space S. Okay. So this S is the one that is modulo translation. Okay, so this is how we define the proper state space here. And the one step transition probability are determined by the following mechanism. So there's two steps. At each time step, we first choose a discrepancy because uh, and in a certain configuration to start with, there's a finitely many discrepancy. So we choose one of them uh, uniformly at random. It can be either one zero or zero one. And from this finite number of available discrepancy, and this is exactly the reason why we need finite number of discrepancy because at the first time step we have to uniformly choose one. So if it's if it's infinitely many, then it's not. First of all, it may not be very clear how we do this, and we have um, few problems afterwards. So it it would be just much easier if we think of finite number of available discrepancy, and then we just uniformly at random pick one of them, okay? That is why there's always uh, the infinitely many ones on the left-hand side and infinitely many zero on the right-hand side, okay? So this chosen pair, either one zero or zero one, will then flips to zero zero or one one, each with probability half, okay? So I, I think I think this is this is a, a sensible decision that why this one must be half because if it's not half then the the, the well the 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 think if we are in the say heavy side configuration if it is not uh, with probability half say with two thirds so it's biased then the walk follows simple symmetric random walk so essentially it will just go to one side. Okay, so it's not uh, particularly interesting. So the most interesting case here is uh, with probability half. Okay, so let's have some notation here. So for this small s in this big s equivalent class s, okay, so this s is, a, is an element. Let n equals to n s greater than zero denotes the number of one blocks, not include the invert one block to the left. And this is the same for the number of zero blocks, not include the invert zero block to the right. So for example, let's say S is this thing. Okay, so we have a lot of ones and then followed by some zero 
and ones sets, and then we have a lot of zeros. So in here, ns is zero because you count the number of groups of the one except the leftmost one. So there's this first group, oops, sorry. This is the first group, second group, third group, fourth group, fifth group, and sixth group. So, so there are six of them. And if you count the zero, because the zeros and one are alternating, you should get the same number here. So except this last infinite zero group, if you count here, you have one, two, three, four, five, six. So you always have six. You, you, you have six in this case, uh, when you count either zero or, or count the ones, okay? So we denote this by, by ns and this n depending on the configuration. So essentially the heavy side configuration have n equals to zero because there's nothing in the middle. Okay, so we enumerating from left to right and let small ni equals to small nis denotes the size of this i zero block and m i equals to mis, the size of the i one block. Okay, so ignoring this infinite uh, one bit, so we have this uh, zero as the first zero block. Okay, so this has size one, so n one is just one. And then this one is the first m, um, uh, first one block, so it belongs to m one. So the m one is just one because there's only one element, and n two is one, and then m and two is six because we have six one here. Okay, so essentially these kind of things store the information on how this uh, configuration behave and we want to store all the information in one representation. So we can represent this configuration as, which is not the heavy side configuration by the vector blocks size of N1, M1 up to N, N, M, N, okay? Because there's um, N groups of zero and N groups of one, so N and M runs to N. So for example, a configuration here like this, we have a representation like this, okay? Because the first group of zero have only one zero, so it's one, only one, one, then we have one, only one zero, we have one, six, one together, so we have six here, and then eight, zero here, so we have eight and so on. So, so the size of the number of elements in this representation should be two capital N, okay? Because there's uh, six groups of zeros here and six group of one. So in here we have 12 numbers, okay? So, so this essentially represent the, the configuration S. So if we have this representation, we can recover back what, what S is by just interpreting back uh, what this is. So, the heavy side configuration is not in this representation because essentially there's no discrepancy here. So there's actually nothing here and it's just zero. So we just uh, have SH, we don't need the representation for that. Right. Yes. So the next thing I want to talk about is the uh, Niepla function. So the, the, Goal or the or the or the objective here is we want to see if we start with a certain configuration may, may have a lot of uh, discrepancy but finitely many, okay. How will the the system evolve, and will it go to the uh, heavy side configuration or, or or not, okay. So we want to apply the, the theorems that we have learned before in the, in the previous two sections. So in, in particular, we want to use the uh, positive recurrence criteria, the Foster criteria here. So we want to construct the Niepela function to do this. So it is, it is quite tricky to, to think of what the Niepela function should be. So, um, we need to define a bit more notations here first to, to, to think about this process. So let S be a configuration that is not the heavy side configuration. Again, okay, and I run from one to N. We denote this Ri, which is uh, depending on S, it's just a sum of N and Js. So remember the Nj is the number of uh, zeros in, in each group, 
except except the the the, the infinite group. So this sum is the total number of zeros in the middle, except the uh, rightmost group. And this t equivalently is the number of one uh, inside the inside this configuration, except the leftmost one. Okay, so we also have a convention that. Uh, Right, so 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 this this runs from one to to i here. So what I said just now is essentially if you put this i equals to capital N, then R N is the total number of zeros here. But say if if R if i is one, then we are just doing one sum. Then this is just n one. So it's just the number of zeros in the first group. If it's r two, then it's the total number of zeros in the first group and the second group, and so on. So so this i is a running index, and same for same for t. Okay. And we always count from the left to the right, but ignoring the uh, inverse group because the index starts from left to right. So in here, we can see that the, with the convention R0 and Tn plus one should be one because R0 is be, before the first group of zero. Okay, so, so that should be, should, be, should be no zero before the first, zero, first group of zero, so it's zero. And again, the same thing for, for this. Okay, if, if we push one step after the last group of one, then we should also get zero number of ones. Okay, so after we define these R and T, we define a Nyepnov function F, which is the set S to R plus as F S H equals to zero. So uh, if we apply this function on the heavy side configuration, we get zero. And for any other S that is not the heavy side configuration, we have this, okay? So, well, this quantity is is the is is half times the sum of this n i r i square and sum of uh, n i t i square. So it is it is actually kind of difficult to to intuitively mean uh, understand what does this mean, okay? But um, say if we get rid of this square. Okay, if we, if we don't have this square, then then you see essentially this this sum from one to capital N M I R I is exactly the same as this sum of N I T I. Okay, because it is it, it just depends uh, how you how you count. Okay, either you count everything from from left to right or or, or to 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 right to left. So. When when you when you when you take the half of these two same thing, you, you get only one of them. So it's either this thing without the square or, or this thing without the without the square. Okay, and and this one kind of have a um, intuitive meaning. So remember that this m i okay, is the is the number of um, ones in, in each block and this R I is the is the zeros okay the sum of zeros before the, the before um the the this this n block uh, i block so if we if we multiply m i r i and then we sum them all together this will kind of give us um, a quantity about um, well essentially how, how much discrepancy is there in, in the system and it is something like the some something related to to like the drift in our previous models and when we take the square we are thinking of kind of the fluctuation the the, the variance here that's the that's the best intuitive meaning that I can get. I mean, it's it's, it's quite difficult to interpret. So so okay. So say we we, we start with this Niepel function, then one can actually check that in fact this f is a martingale. So what I mean by that, remember when f is a martingale, it means that we when we take the expectation of f 
sine n plus one minus uh, f sine n, even sine equals to s, this is zero. And this is a very important fact. And this is exactly why we pick this function is because, um, well, after try and error, we have this very nice fact that f is a martingale, which is very useful for our calculation. Okay, so here's the um, theorem that I want to present you. So it's uh, theorem 20. So the photo model is positive recurrent, okay? So, so you see the photo model have, have no parameters here. So, so this means that no matter which configuration we start with, we always end up with the uh, heavy side configuration and stay in there, okay? So this theorem is first proved by uh, Ligert in 1976. And the proof that we present here uh, after, after this slide is from Belisky et al. Uh, 2001. Okay, so let's see how we can prove this thing here. So, so clearly, as, as we discussed this before, definitely we want to apply the Foster criterion because the Foster criterion gives us the positive recurrence uh, classification. So the problem is uh, what kind of function that uh, we want to use. So in fact, the function that we need to use here for, for this case is the function that we describe f as i n to the power alpha. And we need some alpha less than one, okay? Which we need to decide later, okay? We don't know what this is now. So say, let's say just uh, this is alpha, but we know that this is, this must be less than one, you know, to make it work. So just from a quick uh, elementary calculus um, calculation, this will give us that in fact, for any alpha between zero and one, then we have this condition, there exists a C1 and for any X uh, in between negative one and one, we have this condition, okay, just, okay. So, so this is an important fact because it helped us to evaluate this expression because this is the expression that we need to calculate in the Foster criterion and we want this to be less than or equal to minus epsilon. Remember the, the condition that we, 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 we need to achieve. So, well, this is quite a complicated expression. So we just take this uh, F psi n alpha out, and then we have F this because we have the condition here. So we just put S in there. So we take this out and all we left with, we arrange in, in this way, okay? So then we can, we can apply the facts here Okay, just use this fact in, in this set so that we can get a C1 out. And then we also have this. Okay. So in here, there's also a step that we use that F n is martingale because you see there's two terms here. There should be the two term alpha X in, in front of, of this, but that term is zero because we prove that um, F is a martingale. And this is, this is very important because now we only have this uh, square term to deal with. Okay, so, so let's try to see how can we, how can we um, evaluate that square term. So define S zero to the power minus R, okay, be the configuration obtained by S by removing the rightmost one for the invert uh, one block. Okay, so, so what does it mean? It means if we start with a certain configuration, there's the infert block on the, on the uh, left-hand side, the infert one block on the left-hand side, and we just remove that, uh, that one. Okay, so essentially we change that uh, one, one to zero. And this is the, the, the other case, is that Sn to the power plus R means that the configuration obtained from S by adding an extra one to the right of the nth one block. So this nth one block is in fact the last one block here and we add the extra one in there. So essentially we change the infinite. If you, if you look at the infinite uh, zero on the right, we change the leftmost zero to one. Okay, so we need to do a calculation here. So we want to see 
the if we apply f remember f is this uh, function here which is related to the configuration with with this mi and ri so if we make this small move here and, and we take the function f we, we're going to calculate the difference between this this small change and the original uh, s account uh, um, with with f so we actually get this um, inequality here but just a quick calculation and also if we do the other one we have uh, we have this inequality here. okay so essentially if you just expand on what is happening with the with the uh, m and i then you see this relation uh, quite obviously right so now we can go back to evaluate this using the uh, first fact so in fact if we if we try to evaluate this so we want to see how this new step can change. Okay, so in fact, there's only, only um, well, finite num number of ways to, to, to have such change because say if we have uh, N discrepancy here, so we randomly pick one of them and each discrepancy have two ways to change. Okay, so there's only uh, two N step, uh, two, two N ways to, to, to change this. So we, we count for all of them, and they have all of them have equal probability. So we have this, um, and we, we group all the other changes accordingly, and we get this uh, inequality here. Okay, so, so this calculation is not immediate, but I just want to show you that this expression can be expressed uh, in, in, in this form. Okay, with only these two uh, change here. Okay, so after that, we just apply the two inequalities that we have uh, in the previous slides, plug this in and plug this in. Then we get a very nice bound here, which is a constant times uh, s to the, to the power four divided by n. Okay. So, uh, did, I, did I define this s? So, so s here, is, is the length of the strain of zero and once between the infinite ones to the left and infinite uh, strain of zero. So essentially all the things in the middle is, is the size of, of S. Because S itself is infinite, but we get rid of two, the infinite component on the left and infinite component on the right. And that, that we denote as the size of, of, the, of this S. So we can bound it by a constant times S to the power four divided by N, okay. So a very important observation here is that the photo model does not increase the number of blocks n. Okay. So in fact, we can just replace this C2 divided by n by, by, by lower bound C0 here. So think about why this fact this is true. So if we have um, any, any discrepancy and, and we change it to either zero, zero and, and, or, or one zero, okay? So in, in, in any case, so think about that the left, left of this discrepancy can be zero or one and the right, uh, right uh, of this discrepancy can also be zero and one. And no matter which case it is, if you change to zero, zero, zero or one, one, because it's not creating a discrepancy in the middle of, of, this, of this pair, so it will either keep the same number of discrepancy or just decreases because you 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 kill all the all the either all the zero or all the one uh, within this group. So so it will not increase the number of blo blocks and it's always decreasing. Okay, okay. So so we have a very nice expression here because now we express this uh, complicated uh, expectation with only this nice bound. Okay, so now we are almost there. We just put back uh, all the calculation because we want to evaluate this. We want to show that this is less than or equal to minus epsilon. So we plug the, the thing that we achieved just now and we, we get this constant times this and this. Okay, so, well, we, we still have a, a slight problem here because uh, we still need to know how to interpret this. Okay, so, in fact, with some work, we can also get an upper bound that this fs is less than or equal to this. Okay, so in, in, in fact, this, this Nebula function is, is very well behaved. We can easily get some 
uh, lower bound and upper bound, uh, depending on this uh, size of S. So now, if we look in the other way, we can also express, we, we can also have a lower bound for S uh, with, with S. So we replace this S to the power of four with um, some power of, of Fs, okay? And then we get this expression, okay? Because S cubed uh, is, is greater than or equal to eight Fs. So we, if we have S four, then we have this eight to the power uh, four over three, which is just 16. And then we, we have this, uh, so, so from these parts, we have minus four over, uh, plus four over three in the power. That's why we, we cancel from alpha minus two to alpha minus two over three. And this is, this power is very, very important because remember we want minus epsilon in on this side. So in some sense, we want to get rid of this uh, we, we want all the constant here. So this is fine, this is fine, this is fine. This one we want to get rid of. So you see, if now we plug in alpha equals to two over three, then this one is gone, okay? This, this thing is one, okay? So in here, we can say this is less than or equal to minus epsilon. So we are good to apply the Foster criterion. And this completes the proof, okay? This, this gives us the uh, positive recurrent condition. So you might ask me why you want to keep this, uh, all this calculation with alpha from the beginning. Okay, because if you know, well, after you, you, you try, if you know that two third is the right power, then why don't you start with the two third? So in fact, this kind of argument is, is stronger than, 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 than just the, the thing that I present here. So in fact, there's an extension of the Foster argument, which is very similar to the criterion. But if give us exactly how many moments exist for, for the stopping time, okay? And that requires us to, 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 to have this parameter alpha here. So if you use the full range, alpha less than one, then one can actually show for any epsilon greater than zero, we have this, okay? We have expectation of the stopping time to the power three over two minus epsilon, given the starting set is finite, okay? And in fact, this, result is sharp. So what I mean by sharp is if you take expectation of tau three over two without this minus sigma, then this is infinite. So this is the other side of the story that uh, we can prove. And the proof is very similar to this argument, but just on the other side. So we also create a near power function and then apply a different criterion on the other side and we, we get conditions like this. Okay, so so this this method have, have some extension, which is very useful to pinpoint this um, this um, kind of moment existence problem. Okay, so, well, essentially that is the, everything about the uh, photo model. So uh, you might say, well, so in here, it is uh, in the photo model, we can only change the one zero or, or zero one to zero zero or one one. Okay, can we do something else? Okay, for sure we can, because we can change uh, zero one to one zero, and that is actually called the exclusion process. So, so let's see how this is related to, to, the, to the model that we have done before. So define P in, in zero one to be the exclusion parameter. So we define the exclusion process, uh, psi n again, with the parameter P, which denotes as EP, exclusion process with parameter P is a time homogeneous Markov chain on state space S. So the setting is the same. S is the one that uh, modulo the, the, the translation, okay? So at each time step, um, yeah, this is a typo. So, so the exclusion model, the, the exclusion process, selects uniformly at random from all discrepancy and the chosen pair zero one will flips to one zero with probability P or otherwise we, we, don't, we don't change it, we keep it as one zero. And if a chosen pair is one zero, then we flip it to zero one with probability uh, Q, which is one minus P, otherwise no move. So, so in short, you can think of, we just pick uh, any discrepancy and we will replace it with one zero 
or, or not, depending on the original one, but it will be one zero after the move with probability P and zero one with probability Q. Okay, so I just want to give you the results here. So this one, this result is slightly more complicated because now we have the parameter P and in fact, the results depending on this probability. So if P is greater than half, then this model, this exclusion uh, process with parameter P is this positive recurrence. And if P is less than half and less than or equal to half, then this process is transient. Okay. So the positive recurrence side is essentially due by uh, Ligert in 1976 and the transient side is by Blitzky et al. Okay. So you see the most interesting case here is when P equals to half. Okay. So P equals to half is the critical case here. So um, this model is, is behaves slightly different than, than the usual model that we see, because in fact, most of the time when we are looking at the trans at, or on the, on the uh, critical case, usually it will be recurrent or, or now recurrent. But in this model, in fact, in the critical case, this process, this exclusion process is transient. So it's somehow quite special about this model. That's uh, the, the critical case is transient. And to prove this critical case is transient, we, we need um, quite a lot of extra work to, to, to do this. Okay. So we will try to give a very short proof on how to do the easy side. So it's the positive recurrence side. So in fact, we can use the same Neapolitan function that we stated before. Okay, so we just use the same Neapolitan function. Okay, we have defined S before. So we just notice that this is just how we count the S. If we count all the zeros and count all the ones and we add together, that's, that's just S, okay. And because we have this relation Ri greater than I and Ti greater than the, the reverse side counting, then we can easily get um, this quantity, which is the sum of Ri plus Ti. It's just uh, the maximum of either this and this. Okay. The reason why we want to do this is uh, remember we can interpret this um, with, with all these uh, R, R, and, R and T, and we can have this bound here. Okay. So, so we skip all the steps here, but I just want to show you this can just in terms of n, p, uh, and this um, size of s. So we just want to bound this. We want this to be a minus epsilon essentially. Okay, so this is where the, the condition p greater than half comes from is because, okay, so there's two sides, say if this one, okay, so, so this is this side, two p minus one, if we take the when maximum, when we take the maximum, if is this one is bigger, then we are looking at two p minus one times uh, s. Then this, when p is greater than half, then this is greater than two n plus two. Then we get this bound, which is less than or equal to minus half. And on the other hand, if we take this, then this is greater than three. Then we can just replace this maximum by three n plus one. And then at the end, we also get this. So, so because the set uh, of S for which both this is less than three and this is less than two n plus two is finite. So what we have shown here is that this quantity will less than half for all but finitely many S. So this condition may not be satisfied for, for some small n here, but there will be finitely many of them because uh, the, the infinite size good. We always have this, this, this bound. So, so that is why we have this, all but finally many uh, S, and that is exactly what we need because we can always allow the, 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 the set A to, to exclude in this condition. So again, by the Foster criterion, we have proved that this EPP is possibly recurrent when this condition is satisfied. This is where we, we use this here, okay? So this is this is essentially the exclusion model. So I think I still have um, a few minutes. So well, so this is essentially the ultimate model. So we have the folder model, we have the exclusion model. So what we what if we put the two models together? So everything is possible to happen. So in fact, there is a literature, a lot of literature about this model, and this is 
usually the general model that uh, people discuss. So this is called the hybrid process or the exclusion photo process. So the max this photo model and the exclusion uh, process, we have to define a parameter beta, which is the maximum priority meter. So essentially this beta control when we will do the uh, photo move and, or when we will do the uh, exclusion uh, and move. So again, it's, it's all the same setup, the exclusion photo process or the hybrid process, uh, psi n with the parameters beta and p, which we denote as hp beta p. Okay, this is hybrid process. This time we did not, depending on two parameters, this is the mixing parameter. This is the uh, exclusion parameter in, in the exclusion part. Okay, this is again time homogeneous Markovian on, on the state space S. So this time at each time step, we decide independently at random whether to perform a photo move or an exclusion move first. Okay, so we choose the, to be the photo move with probability beta and an exclusion move uh, with probability one minus beta. Okay, then we just execute the chosen move accordingly as we stated before. So if we pick the photo move, we do the photo, photo move thing, we, we change that, uh, that we, we first pick a random discrepancy and then we change it to either uh, zero, zero or one, one. If it's an exclusion move, then we have with probability P, we change it to one, zero with probability one minus P, we change it to uh, zero, one. So you see this, this beta here is very important. And when beta is zero, then there's no chance to uh, choose the choose the photo model. So this will be just the exclusion process with parameter P. And when B is the one, then we don't have any chance to choose any exclusion move. So it's just the photo model. Okay, so we, again, we want to understand the recurrence classification of this model. And in fact, the, this is an open problem in the literature. So, so no one have a, have a full classification here. So these are the two theorems uh, that is uh, due to Bleski et al. And in 2001 again, and uh, this give you partially the answer. So in fact, there is uh, one more theorem. I, I mean, there's actually a few more theorems to, to, to on this model, but they are quite complicated. So I will just skip here and I will just present the, the simplest two theorem here. So if beta and P are such that one minus P one minus beta is less than one third, then this process HP beta P is possibly recurrent. Right, so essentially if you see if beta is big enough. So if, if say beta is uh, two third, okay, if it's bigger than or equal to two third, then this, this thing is less than or equal to one third. So no matter what P is, this one, this condition will always satisfy. And so this, this process is always positive recurrence as long as beta is greater than two third. Okay, it's immediately observed. Here, so what we mean by that is, if we have um, the 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 mixing, so remember the the mixing is is beta is choosing the photo model, which we know is positive recurrent, and the exclusion process depending on what what p is. If we pick enough probability for the photo model, which is recurrence, then it dominates the system to, to get the positive recurrence for the for the whole model here. Okay, when, when beta is greater than two third. Okay, so, so the other theorem is that for any beta greater than zero and P is greater than half, then the process is also positive recurrent. So for this side is that, well, so, so this is just to make sure there is some chance uh, to pick the the um, to to pick the photo model so that this is genuinely a, a hybrid process, and if we have p greater than equal to half, so remember if um, if we have p greater than half, okay, in in the in the exclusion process, then it's positively recurrent, okay. So naturally, if we mix these two conditions, so if we have p greater than half and we mix with some photo photo uh, move, which is also positive recurrent because both um, process is positive recurrent by themselves. So we, and when we mix them, it's also positive recurrent. But the interesting case here is when P is equals to half, okay? Because when P is equals to half, 
in fact, the excursion process part is transient while the um, uh, photo model is positive recurrent. And when we mix them, it gives us positive recurrence. Okay, so this this is a this is a very important important fact that that is proof in this theorem. And is when we mix that uh, transient process and the positive recurrence process, it's not clear what that is. And this theorem gives us that the answer is positive recurrence. And there's a, a a lot more theorems in the literature try to try to solve this problem. But currently, there's still an open region. Uh, for 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 beta and, and p, that we don't never know if it is a transient and recurrence. But there's strong evidence to show that there is some part in this problem in this space that is transient, and some part is positive recurrence. Okay, for this uh, mixing model. Okay, so um, this is the end of all the examples that I want to present in 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 my free lectures. So I want to make a very short summary of um, the method that we're using. So you see all these uh, free lectures, we are using the very same uh, semi-martingale methods in various ways. Um, so I want to give you some comments on, on this method. So about the strength and weakness. So although the methods here are very robust and constructive, sometimes you can see that they are tricky to start with the right Neanderthal function without any experience. So if you if you if you haven't tried to do this kind of calculation before, it's actually very difficult to see well what should be the Neanderthal function to to pick up because there's actually no hints. You can see there's actually not much hints from the model or from the setting what you should start with, and without explicit calculation of the expectation, it's very hard to tell if the function that we pick is indeed the right one. Okay. So this Neapolitan function for a specific model is usually not unique. It can be in various forms. So it, it, it doesn't need to be one that function that works. As long as you can find a function that works, then, then it's perfectly fine. Okay. To pick a good Neapolitan function that enables simpler calculation among all of this, which satisfy the condition in the theorem, is a skill derived from experience. Okay, so so you you might say, well, it, it, because many functions work. So, so essentially, if I pick one that works, then, then it's okay. But the problem is if you pick a very complicated function, so although it, it works, but it might not be the, the, the best situation because you want the simplest calculation in, in your argument to, to make this work. And to find this simplest uh, Neapolitan function is, is actually very tricky. And it's just a, a skill derived from, from experience after you have uh, do a lot of, of, of this calculation. So, um, so, so remember, uh, say in, in the first lecture, we try to prove the uh, Ploys theorem, a uh, part of Ploys theorem for uh, D equals to two. So we, uh, we want to show that when D equals to two, the simple symmetric random walk is, uh, is a recurrent and we apply a function F2, which is slightly complicated with the law. So essentially that function will work for, for dimension one, two, but in fact that is an overkill because we can pick a much simpler function to, to work on one dimension. Okay, so so there's kind of an art to, to really how to pick the uh, simplest Neapolitan function here. Okay, so I want to end my presentation with a quote from experts in a, from an expert in the semi martingale methods. So it, it kind of shows that uh, how powerful this method is. So if one cannot use a certain method other than the semi martingale method to deduce a recurrence classification, then one can try to use the semi martingale to deduce the classification, okay? So if one can use a certain method other than the semi martingale method to deduce a recurrence classification, then one can surely use the semi martingale method to deduce the same classification. Okay, and these are the reference uh, in related to uh, my free lectures. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Hugo. Uh, do we have any questions? So uh, if there are no questions for now, I have one, may yeah. I ask? Yes, go ahead. So, <clears throat> So you're saying uh, when you were doing uh, your 
exposition about the Lyapunov functions, you did some Taylor expansions, right? And, yes. And there was a martingale term and you canceled the first or the first term of your expansion. And then you only looked at the x squared, right? Which was, I think, the I mean, variance. I know that that calculation is not a Taylor expansion. Yes, you're right. Most of the time we do a Taylor expansion, but that calculation we did not involve the Taylor expansion because we, we use that fact to avoid that in, in, essentially. So instead of doing a Taylor expansion, one plus x alpha minus one. Ah, yeah. So that's it, just it, an upper it, bound. Exactly. So, so we only have the x term, which is the first term that gives you zero because of mm. the martingale property and the x square term. So this square term is this. So we don't have the, the things to do with that. Right, now I, mean, I understand. Especially this can also prove by, well, this is the type of Taylor expansion in some sense. It's just, right, so I, I got confused. But my question would be, can we get a sense of what type of Lyapunov functions we're trying to use uh, from the first and second moments of our process? Um, well, I, I don't think it is. So first of all, sometimes the model, because the method here is very general, sometimes the model does not really described by the first two moments of, of certain things, right? So, so say in, in here, it is it's not very clear what the first two moments are because we, we, we did not say anything about this. So sometimes it can be very tricky to see how we can divide it. So for example, even if we have the first two moments, we, we know exactly what it is, but you still need to think how can we actually describe them Okay, say how many terms that we need to take and what are important and what is not. So, so you see in the, in, the, uh, in the last lecture about the uh, half street model, in the most general case, you, you see the mu is depending on a lot of terms and the sigma is depending on a lot of terms. And it's not clear how many terms that we need to take only until we, we pick the correct uh, Miyakura function and, and try and error. So if, if you see, if, if you only pick uh, the first two, first term of, of the mu and sigma, it just doesn't work because it's not enough to deduce any, any argument there. Then we try a bit more to see if it works. If not, then we, we just go again. This is it's a try and error process. It's mm -hmm. very difficult to see how, it, there's, there's no indication of what, what it should, must work at the, at the first sight. Although for, from experience, you can see what kind of functions that you may try. Okay, so you, you first, of, first of all, you may try say x to the power something, say x to the power alpha, and alpha can be negative or positive depending on depending on uh, which side you're working on. And then you want to try some log function, maybe it's also work, and they try to have a mix of them. So usually that's starting point. So we have a question from the Blina. The Blina, yes. uh, please. So hi, Hugo. So thank you for the talk. So I'm going to ask you maybe a stupid question regarding this uh, Volker model. And so if we start, first of all, you have a finite number of interfaces in the Volker model and each of those interfaces are performing a random walk, right? If I understand correctly. Uh, no, 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 not, not exactly is uh, the, the random walk is only coming from the heavy side configuration. So yeah. if, if you look at this, then then this this the movement of this is a, is a random walk. It's a simple yeah, thing. So that's what I mean. I mean, I mean by the interface like a one zero or zero one, a discrepancy. Uh, not, not exactly, because each time, because if, if you consider a general case like this, so each time you pick one of them and then you move one, and then you pick another one and move one. So it kind of affects each other. Because if, if you move in a in some way, then some of the groups will cancel out. So so you see some of the sorry, some of the what will cancel some of the, out. Some of the blocks will cancel out. So, exactly. for, so for example, if you have say zero one, if you pick this this pair zero one and you change it to say zero zero, then this block is completely gone and it will never come back. You see, because That's exactly it, it, what I wanted to ask you. So you can think that at each of these, I call these discrepancies as the, uh, the as the interface. Yes. So yes. that's a wrong way of probably saying it. So let's stick to discrepancies. Then at each of these discrepancies, you can think of a particle that's performing a random walk and is being killed off, right? Yes. 
eventually killed off. So uh, what I thought that probably this process will eventually have some kind of a stationary distribution or am I wrong in thinking in those lines? Yes, yes. So so we, we have proved that. That is exactly what we proved. So, so when we mean it by positive recurrent, it means that any configuration, mm -hmm. after some time, it will go to the uh, heavy side configuration. Ah, okay. And the, the heavy side configuration is like this. The idea is because after some move, because it's say if we change this to zero, then it kills off one block and then you just move mm -hmm. around and at some point it kills off some block again. And mm -hmm. the idea is because the number of blocks cannot be increased by mm -hmm. the uh, moves. So at some point, all the blocks are disappeared. Okay, so we're only left with the, the infinite box. Okay, so, so do you know the time by which approximately in that, um, some idea, you know, about the time by which, you know, this will reach the stability? So that is what uh, we, we, we don't have the, the explicit time, but we have the moments uh, here. So this is, uh, let me have a look, where, this one. So, so this is where we, we present here. So this is the stopping time. That is the expectation of how long ah, it is. Okay, okay. It is to the uh, power yeah. two, three over two without the epsilon, then this is infinite. But if we minus epsilon for any epsilon greater than zero, this is one. Okay, thank you. That, that's so very- The result here is very sharp. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, uh, Hugo, I have another question. Yes. Uh, this paper that you quote from Ligget, uh, yes. is uh, just Ligget or there's someone else in the paper? It's this one, just Ligget. Ah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> 